Kia ora koutou. welcome to Top Talks, and this week we have with us the irrepressible Dr. Mike Joy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, Mike. I have to say though, you weren't our first choice. <laughs> I, Thanks. I'm sorry about that. It was, it was going to be Alison Jews. Right. Who I know. I'm always in her shadow. You're yeah. always in Alison's shadow. Alison, yeah. uh, Unfortunately, couldn't make it, but but you were you ran a close second. Okay. Uh, so it's good. I was going to have you here eventually. But, you know, um, but so so thanks for thanks for coming along and deputising right. for, for uh, the the uh, formidable Alison Jude. Mm -hmm. And I hope I hope we can talk to her at some stage too. Um, hey, you've had quite an incredible career, um, but you you didn't start off in science, did you? Do you, no. do you want to just tell us a bit about your a bit about your background and and your chicken history? <laughs> well, if you, it'd probably be easy to tell you the jobs that I haven't had rather than the jobs <laughs> I have had because I've I've done so many different things, but but a lot of it was um, left school and worked in a recycling factory, drove forklifts, drove trucks, drove taxis, restored a. Uh, a hundred year old yacht and and um what you still have no well the, uh, another one yeah another one? Oh, i've got okay. an 87 year old now so a young oh, okay. a younger one now you tra yeah, tra yeah. Tra traded it in yeah newer, yeah newer yeah model. <coughs> um sailed the pacific um oh just yeah um built a house and um installed bathrooms built decks built garages installed air conditioning uh had a milk run uh had a cafe um so you're a handy dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, handy, handy I just, I'm just, the house. I'm just one of those, um, yeah, the old school Kiwis who just you never, you never paid anyone to do stuff for you. You did it always yourself. Sure, you know, yeah. that's what I learned from my dad, and so that was how I carried on. But then um, in my 30s, which was um, early 90s, then things weren't so easy. You know, I couldn't just walk from job to job and all that kind of thing. So, and an opportunity came up to. Um, to, to rent a house for next to nothing in Bulls and um, go to Massey University. So Ali, my partner, and I, both in our early 30s, went to uni and um, then couldn't escape the place, stayed there, did a master's and then a PhD and then started lecturing there. And then, wow. and that went right through until a couple of years ago when I got this job at the Institute of Governance and Policy Studies at Victoria University. So you don't still live in Bulls? No. Okay. Paikakariki now. Oh, yeah, we've gone up in okay. the world. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah, the Miss Bulls, yeah. So, what drew you into water quality in, in particular? Um, well, I, <coughs> I studied, um, I, was, I was kind of inspired by a lecturer in undergrad who, uh, the, the infamous Russell Death, Dr. Death, and oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he was, he Russell? was, he was doing some great stuff in freshwater and, and really around assessing and biomonitoring. And so, um, but really, the story of how I got involved in the whole thing was was just getting angry with how much. Um, so I was looking at native fish mostly and using native fish and what lives in the river as a measure of of the health of ecosystems. And um, I quickly realized that as fast as I was finding them and, and doing work on them, they were disappearing. Our rivers were going downhill so fast. And, and then I started to speak up about that because I, could just, I just got angrier and angrier at seeing the, the destruction that was, that was going on around the country. And it was, you know, right through, so from 2000 onwards. Yeah. And then there was the, the infamous um, John Key event where I... I wrote an, an op-ed in the Herald about how we were kidding ourselves about this clean green image here and it got picked up by um, Stephen Sacker on that uh, show and he had, um, what's it called, Hard Talk. And Hard he Talk, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was interviewing John Key and he said, you know, this freshwater ecologist says you're kidding yourself, you know, all the, you've got all these really bad statistics here. And he said, oh, well, you know, um, uh, he said, scientists are just like lawyers, you know, you just go get another opinion when you don't <laughs> like that one. And wow. so, and, wow. and that's, so he, he kind of made, uh, made a whole lot of opportunities for me to speak up about what was happening yeah. because of that statement. I mean, even, even lawyers were pissed off about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't just scientists, it was lawyers as well. So, I mean, that, that kind of, and then, yeah, just, I mean, the frustration of 
of just trying to get the word out that we're not clean and green and we are trashing the place at an incredibly fast rate and and that's yeah that's why I've been involved yeah. And so that's kind of how you how you've made your your name as mm. a as, as a voice for our rivers. Um, uh, I have heard it commented the irony that of of uh, for those of for those of you out there who've never come across Russell Death, he's a very uh, quietly spoken and 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 calm scientists uh, and and you became his oh uh, taxi <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of became his his offsider uh, as 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 Dr Joy but actually uh, you, you were you were more the doom and gloom mm. uh, side of the bargain so. Uh, a bit, a bit of irony in that relationship. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's true. And, and I mean, he, w he never wanted to speak up, although he's much more, he has got as angry as me. It just took a bit longer. And now, and now he speaks up, you know, he, he's really, you know, gets into it as well now, you know. Yeah. And so when you talk about the decline of native fish, you're not mm. talking about trout? No, no, well, I mean, they are declining as well, but, um, you know. For those of you who don't know, trout not native. No, they're not native. No. You know. No, so I mean the work with native fish was really around just using them and what lives in the rivers as a way of assessing. Yeah. The, the trouble is that we have all these, we've kind of got stuck with this and, it, and, and actually it was really cool to see the Parliamentary Commission for the Environment just put out a report the other day saying how we're basically measuring the wrong things the wrong way and not consistently all over the country and so we've got a real mess with our freshwater monitoring. And that's because we take, we take monthly samples. You know, I think the best way if, if to, to try and get it across would be if you imagine that you wanted to know what the rainfall was at your house. So you had a rain gauge and you only put it out on the first Monday of every month. And then you pulled it back in again and you kept it inside for the rest of the month and then you stuck it out again. That's what we do with our freshwater monitoring. We do it monthly when we know these things vary hugely through that time. And so that's one of the major flaws there's a whole lot more that I mean surely we have the technology now to have oh, we, we do monitoring yeah. in, in rivers right we, okay. we know and we've known for a long time that what we're doing is really bad but there's this, there's a couple of things going on it actually suits a lot of people to not know what's going on so so measuring things badly actually suits regional councils down to the ground because they report on themselves and and so they don't you know it's quite handy for them to be able to say well it hasn't changed you know nothing's changed or it's got better or you know when, when, when the measures are really really bad and can't tell you what's going on actually quite suits them. I, I, I call them management measures that we have at the moment they're not an ecologist's way of measuring it's a it's just right. a simple cheap cheap easy and we get results that don't show us up to be looking too bad. So dunk a test tube in a river and see what yeah, it looks like. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's it. Yeah. Can you give us then a, a fishes or a eels or a white baits eye view of our r rivers over the past? So you've been studying them for thirty years. Yeah. Twenty. Twenty-five years. Twenty-five yeah. years. Yeah. So, from the perspective of. Uh, so there's like the kokapu and, and mm. these other, you know, quite s small New Zealand fish and, uh, and, and, and eels, of course, and whitebait, which is yep. now people don't, a lot of people don't realise that's endangered as well. And, and well, some, well, some species are. Yeah so, yeah, so overall three quarters of our native fish are on the threatened species list. Yeah. And, and I can't find another country in the world that has... You know, the average for the rest of the world is about 36% threatened right. species. So we're, we're way ahead of the rest of the world on but the number of threatened species. And that reflects yeah. what we've done to the rivers. You know, they're, they're threatened because of yeah. that. And, and, and but from their perspective, can you mm. paint a picture of what's mm. happened to their world over the last 30 years? Well, yeah, it's all about intensification. So it's about land use change. And we had a big hit, you know, with colonisation and, 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 you know, probably pre that a bit with, with fires and clearance, but the big hit land, uh, you know, land cover clearance so that wiped out forests so we have a lot of sedimentation of waterways. But then in the, in the last three decades, it's intensification. It's um, irrigation, lots of fertilizer being put on and palm kernel. So artificially high stocking rates because it's not natural. You know, go back, I was milking cows in the eighties and um, there were, we didn't put anything on, you know. We, the number of cows 
was how many you could carry through a whole year on that piece of land. So it really limited the number of cows you can. Once you start bringing in artificial fertilizer, so nitrogen fertilizer, which is the, the you know one of the biggest issues we have is the nitrification of our waterways. Um, plus palm kernel, we're the biggest importer of palm kernel in the world. So there are a whole lot of environmental issues around the you know the palm plantations, and we are part of that by taking the kernel after they've taken the get the oil out of it. So just all of these things mean that we now have twice or three times as many cows per hectare or per acre than, than what we had before. And then the issue is um, in the intensive dairy country, well, I mean, we're just intensifying overall with humans and animals, but it's, and most people don't get this, the urine, it's the urine from the cows. So you put a whole lot of nitrogen fertilizer on the grass, on the land, it grows lots of grass. The cows eat the grass, only a tiny bit goes to the milk. The rest they excrete back out in the urine and it goes down because we have our cows outside. You can't catch it and put it on evenly. If, if anyone's seen a cow peeing, you'll know what it's like. It's a gush of fluid that comes out on a small area of land, grass. The grass can't take it up. It goes down into the soil profile or into the gravel or into the aquifer, makes its way through the soils to the rivers and the aquifers and the lakes and, and the, eventually the sea. And, and that, in the same way that it grows more grass in the paddock, it also grows more algae in the lakes and the rivers as well. And then you get these secondary effects of, of a lack of oxygen in the river because the algae is taking up all of the oxygen. Um, people might be familiar with the dead zones off the coasts around, you know, like off the Mississippi, there's a massive dead zone there. Same thing, nitrogen flowing down the river, massive algal bloom, sucks out the oxygen, everything's dead. It's just an over-fertilised situation, you know. And it comes from fossil fuels. That's the crucial bit to understand that we're making milk from oil or gas. We're making it from fossil. So, so that's, and then that's we use the drive. fossil fuels to take the water out. Yeah, of the, <laughs> yeah we use fossil fuels to, to, to drive the irrigators and all that kind of thing, to put the fertiliser on, to ship the palm kernel over here. The whole thing's dependent on fossil fuels. Then to get the, the water out of it, we use coal to dry it and then we put it on ships and we ship it somewhere else where it goes mostly either to replace breast milk in Asia or it goes as additives to junk food. You know, this whole we feed the world story is a complete crock. A tiny proportion of it goes into milk and cheese and nice things. The rest of it, it doesn't. And so we just, it's just a, you know, a commodity market kind of situation which is a whole that's a whole other, a, other conversation yeah. yeah yeah so from the so to summarize it from the fisher's eye view in the last 30 years they've had they've had sediment yep which makes it harder to see and eat well and yeah where, the, where they where they live basically in the river is is full of fine sediment so there's the spaces well we call them the interstitial spaces so so when there's a healthy river and it's got rocks and boulders there's gaps there's a labyrinth of gaps and that's where they where they were living when you see a river like most of you will see rivers where it's the odd rock in a bed of sand basically all of those interstitial spaces have been filled up and all you've got is living so if you think in a natural river and we've done you know um, radio tagging of the fish to show this they spend 90% of their time down in the interstitial spaces and they come up for 10% of the time. So it's like an apartment building and that's where the fish live. When they get sedimented it fills up and then you can only live on the roof of the apartment then. And so way less density in that. So that is the impact of the sediment. The nutrients driving big algal blooms. Algae. So algae, a little bit of algae is good. A little bit eat. of algae is what, they, what, they, what, what drives the whole ecosystem. But too much. But too much and it's like Sucks the oxygen yep. out of the water. Yeah, and yep. a whole lot of other effects as well, but you know, the smothering and all that kind of thing. So but, they're drowning but it, in food. It's almost like well, it's like a, imagine a, being in a room full of bananas. Yeah, or or I was thinking more like say say for a sheep, you know, you, you imagine this nice, closely cropped grass that the sheep's eating, which is what the natural level of perifitin is. Yeah. But but then you imagine that a whole lot of fertilizer goes on and it turns into a forest and sheep can't climb trees and you know so the whole thing's there but it's not edible to them so for the invertebrates that are at the base of the food web they can't get the food that they need because it's not the natural food it's it's yeah. a forest it's filamentous algae that's not 
and rather than a film, a layer on top of the rocks and the sediment. Interesting. Okay, mm. so that that gives a really good sense of what's what's happened to our to our waterways. That's just the ecological side yeah, of yeah, it, yeah, but but yeah. then there's the the human health side of it, which is another big issue. And you know, of course, the fish couldn't care less if if there's E. coli in there. That only affects us, right. you know, and vice versa. So you could have perfectly E. coli is, e. coli is just the one of the bacteria that that's mammalian gut. So it, it's a from poo. Poo. It's a fecal yeah. oral pathway and they're an indicator of that pathway and not a very good one, but that's what we use. Yeah. But you could have perfectly clean, safe drinking water, uh, say a swimming pool, you know, and it would be fine for us, but no fish could live in there. Whereas, or, or you could have a perfect habitat with native fish, but have some poo going in there and we would get sick and they wouldn't, there's, there's no problem. So they're two very separate issues yep. that often get confused and often get confused on purpose mm -hmm. as well to, to cover it up. And if we, I mean, if, if, if we just stopped putting as much nutrients in there, would these habitats repair themselves or would they? Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of a river. It's a flowing thing, you know, right. really quickly. I mean, there's a lag time of the of the nutrients getting through the soil yeah. um, you know take canterbury it's really really fast because it's all gravel um, you stop putting it on it will very quickly stop making its way yeah. to the streams in the aquifers yeah but uh you know we can we can go more into this but rivers yeah they can fix themselves really really quickly and from a sediment perspective can they uh, yeah 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 themselves? yeah they'll they'll flush them i mean there's so many examples of where catchments have been fenced off and planted and, and people are, wow, you know, in 10 years, this muddy bottom thing is suddenly a stony bottom stream. They're wow. there. The stones and boulders are all there. They don't move. They just get buried. And so, yeah. you know, as soon as you stop that supply, the, the, the sediment's actually moving all the time, and, 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 but it's just being replaced. It's moving down, you know, it's, so you get all the harbours that are filled. You know, you can just about anywhere around New Zealand look um, back, you know, a couple of hundred years ago and big ships were going up, the Whanganui, you know, um, the Waihau, all these rivers that used to have ships going up. Now you run aground and you kayak in them because of all the sediment that's built up yeah. and, and those things. So it's just, it's moving, but it's being replaced all the time. Stop it being replaced and it'll keep moving down, but right. then you'll start to clear from the top down. You'll get the bed come back again, yeah, you know. Yeah. But lakes are no, much, much slower in lakes and estuaries, okay. yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's kind of the ecological perspective, the, the fish's eye view. If we want to zoom back up to, to government policy, okay, so we've seen this trend over the last 30 years. Then the national government, the last national government, brought in its national policy statement, which did some stuff, tried to bring in some standards at the very least, but you felt they were flawed. Oh yeah, I mean they shifted the goalpost. Oh, if you go back a step further, those national policy statements should have come in within a year or two of the RMA. So back, and it should have come 1991. in... 1991. Yeah, 91. That's when they should have brought it out. Right. What happened was by leaving it until 2013, all of the regional councils just could be picked off one by one. You know, Horizons is a fantastic example. They try to put some tough rules in. Every fertiliser company, Fonterra, Gangs of lawyers front up with, you know, $500 an hour guys all filling up the room. All of that pressure on those poor little councils to back down on any, you know, any limit setting that they did. So, yeah, it was great that eventually, 20 years too late, they bring in the national policy statement. But what they did was shift the, um, the goalposts. So, for example, the ANZAC guideline, which is the Australasian guidelines that would greed limits for nitrate in, in fresh water said 0.44 so just under half a milligram of nitrate was the was the limit because after that you get these algal blooms under the national policy statement they set it at 6.9 milligrams so a whole lot of that intensification that happened over the last 10 years or more happened because there was a backing off and, the, and they, they you know they said this was going to happen so so it had just allowed it, it allowed you know, another 10 years of, of, of trouble. And, you know, we're, we're at the stage of trying to change that at the moment, and I suspect they'll back off it again, but we'll see how that goes, you know. Right. Mm. So that, 
Okay, so that, that's a, a potted summary of, of what of what the last government did. Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess the other they one... Were the trying to, they were trying to regulate for nitrogen toxicity, weren't yeah, they? Rather yeah. than Rather yeah. than algal blooms, which is the, the major yeah. problem that nitrogen causes. Yeah. So the yeah. scientists, I mean, the classic was... So what they did was take a... An aqu imagine an aquarium here sitting here. You've got a bubbler control, you know, giving oxygen. You've got temperature control. And, and you've got some fish swimming around, you get nit um, nitrate and you add it. And then when 20% when of the fish die, which is at uh, LDL 20, that was at 6.9 milligrams. So but what happens in the river is that when it's hot in summertime and the algae's blooming, the temperatures are really high, the oxygen levels are really low. So it's so unrealistic to think that they're gonna die of toxicity because they can't die twice. They're already dead at half a milligram or a bit over half a milligram. They can't die again at 6.9 milligrams. It was a complete crock. The only time, if you had a stream that was a subterranean stream that no light was getting into and the nitrate got up to 6.9, then it would kill the life. But we just, we don't have any, many, any. So that's kind of like, that kind of limit works in places like aquifers un underground. Yeah. Right, right. So, so I remember Amy Adams asked, was asked, um, Eugenie Sage asked Amy Adams in Parliament in question time, so why have you shifted this limit to 6.9? She said, I asked the scientists. And she did ask the scientists. She asked them what the toxic limit was, you know. I mean, I always, and, and I think Russell said this at the time, it would be like if the Minister of Police said, to the medical, uh, you know, so, you know, the the experts in, in, in blood alcohol, that let's w what's the toxic level of alcohol in your bloodstream, and we'll set the drink driving limit at that because that's what the experts say. The because if you ask them what the yeah. toxicity level is, they'll tell you what it is. Yeah. But that <laughs> that doesn't make it all right because we know that so much less than that causes harm. You know. Yeah. So it was just complete politicisation of science. You know. Yeah. And yeah. So. I remember your analogy about the oxygen levels as well, and, mm. and the the the, um, the limits for um, oxygen levels. So you get these algal blooms, and 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 they and they suck the the oxygen out of the you know out of the mm. water, and the, and the limits allowed for these oxygen level fluctuations, so that most of the time there was enough oxygen in the river, but not necessarily all of the time. Mm. Um, and I remember you well, yeah. giving an analogy of... Well, like say in here, if we, sh if we sealed this room up and sucked the oxygen out, even if it was only for 10 minutes, we'd all be dead, right? And, and over the day, that's only, you know, what, a couple of, not even a percentage of the day, but you're dead anyway. It doesn't matter that it's not for long because that's what kills you, you know? So we have a whole lot of these limits. The other part of it was that it, it goes like this. So um, plants photosynthesize, most of you remember that from school. Um, algae's doing the same thing. So three or four o'clock in the morning, the oxygen levels, are, you know, bottom out, everything's dead. In the afternoon, four o'clock, it, it maxes and, and sometimes going up to 160%. So the example of, of the Hopelands Road site in Manawatu, 30% in the early morning, 160% in the afternoon. The scientists, well, the, the, the people monitoring the river would come along with their probe and stick it in the river at lunchtime and go, oh, it's 100%. It's exactly where, because it's on that limb, you know, it's, it's on its way up. We, we wrote a whole paper about this, you know, about how stupid it is. If you'd gone there at four o'clock in the afternoon, it would have been off the scale. If you'd got up at three o'clock in the morning and driven there, it would have been right off the bottom of the scale, you know, but you have this in the middle and the Ministry for the Environment guidelines are 80 to 100 percent is fine. You know, just completely missing the picture, and it's the same. So, were they setting their alarm clocks to go? Oh, you better go monitor that river right now. <laughs> it was just part of their run that they get there at lunchtime. You know, so um, I mean, and and that goes for seasonally as well. That we only, you know, what's like in New Zealand. If you you get a storm, a big rainfall comes through and washes out all that all that algae, then then you reset everything and everything's healthy again. So, as long as say, the people that are measuring the algae or measuring everything else go well. There was only an algal bloom 10% of the time, you know, that's all right, isn't it? Well, no, because they're all dead at that time, but it sounds cool. So, well, 90% of the time it was okay. And most people go, well, that sounds all right, you know, but not thinking that, well, if we only had oxygen 90% of the time, we'd all be dead, you know, but it's, it's just you know, an easy way of getting around yeah. that reality, yeah. 
So under this government, we've mm. seen a, a refresh yep. of the national policy statement. Yeah. And well, we yeah we've well, <laughs> well they're they're working through mm. the process of, mm. a, of a refresh. Yep. And you were involved in that process. Yep. You know, I don't know what you're comfortable with sharing, but I mean, mm. at a, at a high level, where did that process get to in terms of what they're now consulting on? What they what they have consulted on? Well, yeah. So the the submissions have closed, and so they're now processing all those. So I was on the science technical advisory group. They had a Kahui Way Māori group and a leaders group that Alison was on. There was some interaction between all of us, but. So we were basically asked to just say what the scientific limits should be. And, and we were, it was really good. David Parker came along to our first meeting and said, cause, and, and I think it was Russ who asked him, do we have to worry about how much it costs? Nope, we just want to know the science. We'll worry about that. You scientists tell us what the scientific bottom lines should be. Um, you know, the others can work on that and we'll come up with a policy based on that. So, so we did that and there was really complete strong consensus that the limit for nitrate should be at one milligram which was and so from 6.9 down to one milligram it's still higher than the old ANZAC one so there was a there were, there, I mean there were regional council scientists on there and things so things slipped a bit but but one milligram is okay it'll 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 be a much if we get it in it'll be a, mu a big a improvement as a limit as yeah, a yeah. bottom line so you yeah. may not exceed that um, and and so there was the whole process, plus we got a whole lot of, so, so the uh, ecosystem health monitoring, which was means that you put um, a continuous oxygen meter in, you don't just do that lunchtime measurement, it has to be a continuous, and you look at those, that fluctuation, so, and, and a bunch of other things that we, uh, fish are to be in there, you know, measuring the, the native fish. So you got um, a job again. <laughs> yeah, Get well, yeah, but it, well, I mean, at the moment, that's what the scientists said, right? It's yeah. still up in the air. So we just got a document today to look at, which is a bit of a summary of the submissions, but it's really all about the big guys. It's about the fertilizer companies, fed farmers, um, and local government New Zealand, and a couple of the regional councils. And it's about their... So we're having a, there's another meeting of the Science Technical Advisory Group on Wednesday to answer these questions, which, which I, I, you know, philosophically have a problem with it. They asked us for the science, we gave it to them. Now they're asking us to, to buckle down because these big guys once again get to throw everything at it. But I think it's really telling that local government New Zealand and the regional councils are involved because they are, you, you know, they should be protecting the environment but it's, it's the remit of regional Yeah, that's the remit councils, of them, yeah. but of regional councils. But their remit is also to protect the economy, and the short-term economy is to allow the continuation of business as usual. So they always see that as number one. They always have, and looks like they always will. So, um, so there's a lot of pressure. I mean, I don't know. There was seventeen thousand submissions went in on that on the national policy statement changes. I can't imagine that they'll even get through putting them into piles let alone reading them <laughs> so they'll they'll just take the big guys and and read those ones which it looks like what they've done you know and is there any any other big issues apart from that nitrogen bottom line um well there's there's no that's the, i mean nitrogen and getting the ecosystem health stuff in there but it's the nitrogen bottom line that set off most people most of the industry because the you know with their with their uh, toxic limit, they've been able to get away with it for so long. So, and, and because the other interesting and crucial part of this is that the science now shows us that nitrate in drinking water is a problem. It's linked with colorectal cancer, and it turns out just by chance or maybe not that the the numbers of the amount of nitrate in in fresh water that is associated with colorectal cancer is very similar to the ecosystem health levels of nitrate in the river. So you've got two, two strong reasons why you, should have, you shouldn't let nitrate go above those limits, both for human health and for uh, ecosystem health. The science on that colorectal stuff is a, is a bit newer though, right? I, I imagine well, it has to be new. Well, stuff. yeah, but I mean, there's no way. It takes 25 years to get the data. Yeah. We've only been collecting it for 25 years. I mean, this is in Denmark where you've, you know, there was millions of people involved in that study. And now there's another one from the States showing very similar numbers. It, 
it, it's, a, it's what I call emerging contaminants, you know. We didn't know about it 25 years ago. Mm. Now we know about it. And, and so they're all going, oh, but that's just new. You know, well, of course it's new because we just we haven't had the data until now to show that there's a relationship between those two things. There so, must be, well, well, I mean, we'll come back to Canterbury. Yeah. But does, it, Canterbury has very high nitrate levels in the in the drinking, drinking water. water yeah. is, is there anything showing up down there in terms yeah. of Yeah, we have the cancer? highest rates of colorectal cancer in the world are in, are in New Zealand and the highest rates in New Zealand are in South Canterbury. Wow. So, you know, I mean, it may be yeah. just coincidence, but it's, yeah. uh, you know. So I it mean, may not be just eating red meat. No. <laughs> well, what nitrate and water does is exactly what, what those, you know, processed meats do in us. It, Bacon and sausages. Yeah, and yeah. Stuff, it yeah. Turn, we, we turn it into nitrite and the nitrate gets turned into nitrite. So the, the pathway to the cancer is the same. It's just the sources are different. Right. You know, and they, they probably work together, you know, but, the, but it's the nitrite, which is what we convert the nitrate into. So, yeah. So two identical things, they're not different. The, the, you know, the link is nitrite yeah. in the body, yeah. Okay, so that's where we're at with the, with the current national policy statement. Um, what do you, you know, have you got any money on the outcome? Are you, are you, are you a betting man? Are you, are you taking well, bets on, on what you think the whole, the way whole through, process will get to? The whole way through, there was all manner of underhand uh, an orchestrated litany of trying to get rid of nitrate limits and trying not to let us get there and trying to downplay things all the time. We caught the ministry out on tricking us and, and there was a big back down and apology. Um, and, and then we, you know, so, so all the way through there's this pressure on us and then now we get to the end when it should be all closed and, and see it's still coming because we have to answer these questions on that. So they're going to keep you know they're going to keep fighting it the whole way through you know so and and there was a there was a really interesting learning for me in that process and um so when when the groups first formed and we we got to all mix together there was one thing that i noticed out of the corner of my eye is that the kahui wai maori group went off into a room at mfe by themselves and and i noticed bang 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 they were kicking people out of the room. So, so when we were doing our thing, us scientists, probably almost sometimes there would be as many MFE officials in the room as there were scientists, all having their input. And, and so what happened was the, the Wai Māori group put out this fantastic report, a really nice six page summary. Ours ended up being 160 pages written by the the boffins and the, the policy people, they did this, and, and, and I realized what they did. They've had a couple of hundred years of dealing with the Crown, and they knew exactly <laughs> what to do, was chuck them, them out. out of the room, and we naively let them <laughs> manipulate the process, you know? And so that was a really good learning for me, is not to be so naive not to be in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, out next time, I'll yeah. kick him out. Yeah, Not to yeah. Be colon no, yeah. colonized. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Too soon. Oh, no, okay. Um, too, oh, too soon. Too soon. Okay. So, so that's that's where we're at with mm. with with the process, and um, but all this pressure is 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 quite interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, let's let's set aside some of the difficult areas for a moment but actually looking across the country am i right in thinking that these limits shouldn't be too hard to achieve no exactly i mean you, it's just the classic situation where the industry has said oh no it's the end of the world you can't do this you know it's going to cost the country a fortune and all yeah. that kind of thing when you actually model it out it's about 13 percent of the reaches and the rivers that are monitored of all of our rivers that would have to change, that breach that limit at the moment. And they're nearly all in Canterbury and Southland. Right. So it's, it's, it's not, you know, the, the Waikato and Taranaki and all those places where traditional dairy farming areas are, it's not a problem. Well, it need, I mean, it needs to change, but it's it, not, yeah, it's yeah. not, they haven't, they don't have to do much to get under the limit there. Yeah. Whereas it, it is a big problem in Canterbury because you've, you've basically turned this dry land into a dairy farm, which never should have happened. You know, it's let's, a wrong let's come back place. To, let's come yeah. back to Canary. But in, yeah. in the Waikato, I yeah. mean, you said 
for 30 years we've been intensifying yep and and so uh, you know there, there is there is this um this this theory which is which is gaining evidence behind it that a little bit of de-intensification is all we need you know a, a few less cows on the land mm -hmm. will will actually be able to get us there in, in, in most of the country yeah no that's right and i mean you know if, if Alison was here she would give you all these examples of where you can bring it back to that level and make more money you know she's got that amazing database of waikato farms where the most profitable farms are the ones with the least impact you know and so it's, it's not even a, you know it's not even a problem but so you can do it you can do it you can farm and make a profit and not harm the environment so that's less nitrogen yep. fertilizer less palm kernel a, a few less cows but yep. Because you're because you're spending less, yeah, it doesn't matter that production's dropping a bit. The profits. The profits better because you're not. I mean, this, the the thing is that I think that uh, there's a some uh, kind of idea that if you put more stuff in, you know, like a, a factory. If you if I was making I don't know clothes pegs, and as long as I had a market, if you put put more wood in and and more workers, you'd just make more and you'd sell more and the profit would go up forever. But farms are biological systems; they have natural limits, and so you add stuff, you add stuff but you don't get more out of it, it yeah. plateaus. And, and in fact, so then productivity starts to decline. And if you look across the whole country, and our Reserve Bank of New Zealand figures show this, we've had um, nearly or over half a percent decline in productivity from, from agriculture in the last 15 years. Because we put more stuff in, but we don't get more stuff out. So we have reached those limits in many of our farms. And so, you know, it, it's it's not crazy. You know, it, I mean, you you could give all a much better story about, you know, that overvaluation of the land and this kind of Ponzi scheme thing that we've got caught up yeah, with on well, the that, land. That, but that, that's that, the that's the trap that we're in, isn't it? But, yeah, and that, and that's what I think is the driver here is that mm. by trying to create more volume, they've been trying to push up land prices. It hasn't really been about profit. It's been about pushing up land prices because of capital gain. Capital yeah. gain, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's been farming in New Zealand for a long, long time. Yeah. You don't make money from farming, you make money from capital gain, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So easing, easing back is not actually gonna hurt our economy, but it might hurt land values a little bit yep. and and perhaps might slightly freak the banks out for a little while yeah but it's all manageable it's, yeah it should be manageable yeah i mean if, i mean it's got you, you don't you don't have any economy without an environment right exactly. so you stuff all your rivers and and you lose i mean how much if though if that link turns out to be right between you know nitrate and colorectal cancer and you have to supply drinking water to a million people in Canterbury, what would the costs of that be? You know, I mean, we just couldn't imagine. And the health costs. I mean, they've done some of the sons in the states on the health costs of treating those cancers, and it's yeah. horrendous. You know, uh, I think I've talked to you about this before, mm. but the the example that blows me away is Barcelona, where they've got all those pig farms in that catchment, and you know, the Spanish love their pork, and they kept putting more pigs and more fertilizer and and until Barcelona's drinking water was, was yeah, stuffed gone. and they had yeah. to set up uh, desalination plants mm. for the <laughs> so so effectively the, the 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 citizens of Barcelona were were subsidizing the the pig farmers effectively yeah. by um, cheap, cheap pork and expensive water yeah uh, well I think we're doing exactly the same in Canterbury we're yeah. subsidizing really bad land use yeah so that, let's come back to Canterbury now, mm. because that's a different conversation to the rest mm. of the country. Canterbury, maybe Upper Waikato, maybe mm. bits of Southland, but but there's there really is an issue there with the with the transition. Why is dairy farming so bad in these areas? Well, Canterbury and especially because it's a gravel outwash. It's alluvial plain, so it's. I mean, I've. I've walked on the farms there. It's like walking across a riverbed when you walk across a paddock. It's just stones, you know, in a lot of those places. So, so when the cows pee, it's almost instant, going straight through into the aquifers, you know. So it's so quick. Those aquifers feed the rivers and then go back down into the aquifers. There's complete interchange between the two. You've, you've even got big areas of Canterbury where the medical officer of health tells mothers, 
not, you know, they have to buy bottled water. Don't use the tap water because it's already over the World Health Organization limit of 11.3 milligrams. You know, that's, that's 10 times higher than the colorectal cancer number where it starts to really increase the chances of getting colorectal cancer. So, so that's blue, the blue baby. The blue baby thing, yeah. which was where the original limit came from. So it's only a small subset of, 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 of people that are, it's going to harm. It's, it's the mothers and their babies. I mean, the babies, because the babies just Over in time, that, that's not a small subset, though. That's no, a, no, it could be a lot of, yeah, no, no, but it, yeah, you could kill everybody. But it's, it's that time when the baby's adapting to getting its um, oxygen transferred itself using hemoglobin right. rather than its mother doing it for it. So okay. this um, fetal hemoglobin, they call it. So, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So we've got this, we've got this porous soil, Canterbury, Upper Waikato, you know, close to Taupo there, bits, bits of Southland. How bad are we talking in terms of what what nitrogen limit is in some of these rivers, or or, or on average that you know what? How 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 bad are we talking compared to the to this one milligram limit? Well, when, when I looked at the drinking water in Canterbury, um, and and we. We went for a drive in the country, went to every little town we could find and took a water sample. We got 113 samples from Canterbury. Two thirds of them um, exceeded that um, colorectal cancer limit. The one milligram. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. Oh, well, 0.87 milligrams is a, a significant increase in the risk and 2.1 is, is a 15%. Is a and the American studies showing that for every milligram after that, it's about another 5% increase in the risk of getting colorectal cancer. Right. So it just, just keeps ramping up as those numbers go up. So um, yeah, two thirds of them were over two and, and about 90% uh, of them were over one milligram. Right. And then we got the city ones, because everybody assumes that Christchurch city is really good. There were 400 and something, around 400 samples from the city from 2015 and a third of them were greater than 2.1 and about another third were between 2.1 and 0.87 and then there was about a quarter which is obviously well i assume is from the deep aquifer which is where the water bottlers want to go the very deep one and they were all well below they were all barely measurable from that real deep aquifer but <laughs> eventually the night yeah it's get just down there it's it just, just takes longer yep yeah yep. okay there are, and, and there are, I mean, you mentioned the Canterbury um, Medical Health Officer saying that some local, uh, you know, that this is presumably in the small centres where uh, they're... It's Hines and Ashburton, so, right. yeah, around there. So, it, so where people might put a bore down. Yeah, but um, no, this, this, is, this is commercial supplies. Um, oh, yeah? Yeah, but no, the... The shallow bores is what he's the medical officer of health's really worried about. The, yeah. the thousands and thousands of farms that have their own water supply and shallow bores. So when I did, I did some tests on some of the farms down there, and the, uh, lots of them were well over six milligrams. The shallow six bores, six yeah, milligrams. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're at the old toxic limit. Well, that six point eight is half the MAV. Yeah. Oh, this toxic limit for life. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But and and that's that's half the World Health. The World Health Organization. Organization. Okay. Yeah, okay. Limit. Yeah. So we're trying to get to one here. Yeah. And there's parts of Canterbury that are that are six. There's yep. a lot of Canterbury that's at least two. Yeah. But the but the limits for the rivers. So you know, yeah. there's a lot of dilution in the rivers that from the you know mountain flows and all that kind of stuff. So. Okay. So we've got a million cows in Canterbury. Mm -hmm. That's roughly, I think that's right. Yep, yep, a bit more than that, I think, but yeah. How many are we gonna need to get to this? Well, I've done some work on water footprinting. So how much water does it take to make a kilogram of milk in Canterbury? And it looks somewhere between 60 and 90,000 litres per kilogram of milk solids. So, so to get that back, so, so that's how much water you need to dilute that nitrogen back to a healthy limit. So, oh, thousand liters, yeah, of water. Of water. That's one to one make one kilo of milk solids because the footprint is calculated by how much water do you need to dilute what's coming off that farm. So we know how many kilograms that of of milk that farm produces, and we know. Um, how much is being leached 
into the groundwater. So this is how much water you would need to dilute that back to get it under the one milligram is 60 to 90,000 litres. So, uh, by the way, officially it's a thousand litres per litre of milk produced. So it's a gross underestimate because when they did the calculation, they said, how much do we need to get it up to that World Health Organization limit? Mm -hmm. Not to that healthy limit, which is what the Footprint Bible says. So, um, an, or another way of thinking of it is you need 25 times more rainfall in Canterbury is the other way to get it to that healthy level. So 25 times less cows or 25 times more rainfall, which one can you do? Wow. Right, so that's how yeah. far they've overshot there. Yeah. And the only way they did that was by irrigation. So there's more irrigation water in Canterbury than the whole country put together, you know, is in that one region. And the really, one of the really bizarrely stupid things about it is, you know, to put these big, they're all pivot irrigators, or well, nearly all of them are pivot irrigators. So the only way you can run them is to chop down the trees. So you had all these rows of shelter belts that were built up over the plains over you know, a couple of hundred years or 150 years because those really strong nor'wester dry winds will suck all the moisture out of the soil. So what's happened now is that because you take those trees away, now once the wind, we're still working on it, somewhere between 50 and 20 knots of nor'wester and the water is, the water is being evaporated out of the soil faster than what those irrigators can put it on at. So the evapotranspiration rate is faster than the irrigation rate. So you're doing it for nothing, basically. So you chop the trees down to put the irrigator in, but then the irrigator, you know, it's just a, one of those stupid, you know, negative feedback things where you just, you might as well not have bothered and you'd, you'd be better off kind of thing. So 25, what, 1 25th yeah. uh, is, is, is what, so actually, bugger all cows in yeah, Canterbury yeah, yeah. is what should be there. You, as it was a cropping area, you know, that's the sort of thing you could do is, you know, low intensity cropping, um, maybe sheep at very low intensity, you know, yeah. it, it's all it could handle. pee all in one spot. No, and the, just too. much smaller animals and much less yeah. pee. I mean, and the other thing is that lactating cows are like a, an engine running at full revs, you know, a lactating cow pees so much more than a, than a non-lactating or yeah. a bull, you know, they just, beef, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, beef, so, yeah, so dairy is worse than beef for mm. water quality. Oh yeah, not yeah. so much for climate emissions. No, well, I mean, yeah, that, that's right. There's, yeah. there's, there's different. I mean, again, you know, you you crank them up lactating all the time, and everything yeah. goes faster. So yeah. there's more emissions of everything. But yeah, how much could something like feed pads help if if people are putting, so if 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 people are putting their cows yep. in a shed for winter mm -hmm. and feeding them there, yep. how much of a difference? Or even know, putting them on open pads during the day and catching it, you could make a huge difference. Because what you do is just catch the, the urine and then spray it evenly. Yeah. And if you spray it evenly and then the plants can take, the grass can take it up. You know, but that, their marketing thing is our cows are outside, you know, yeah. and there's this perception that Having cows outside would be better for the environment. Actually, it's not true. It would, I mean, at better the intensity the that we have at the moment. Yeah. Right, right. No, it would actually, we, I mean, in, in summertime, it's so hot there with the, the stones heat up during the day. You want to walk around in these paddocks at nine o'clock at night. The heat coming off the ground is incredible. You know? I've been through the Mackenzie yeah. Basin in summer and yeah. I you know all the cows were standing under the irrigators for shade shade it's, yeah yeah uh, no. it's, it's but then in winter crazy. time you've got you know sleet snow, and yeah, snow yeah, and yeah. there's no cover because they've chopped all the trees down yeah, you know it's it. extreme that place is not designed that for that's cow. where you know having a, a shed you, you you know and you had the door open on the shed the cows would all be inside not outside you know yeah, they yeah. would there's, they're not they wouldn't want to be out in that nobody would so you think that's a potential part of the solution here well um, I mean if you want to keep doing it I think you know there's so many other reasons why farm you know the animal farming can't continue into the future around around energy greenhouse gas emissions you know a whole lot of reasons that it's a really inefficient way of producing protein you know it's just this and there's so many alternatives coming up so I, I don't think it it would be you'd need to spend so much money to keep doing to flogging a dead horse basically you know you're not 
it's a pretty it's a pretty marginal thing that you're doing i can't imagine that it'll be worthwhile spending money to keep that going because it's just being propped up at the moment by a whole lot of other subsidies so but you know if you want to keep doing it yeah get them off the grass is the way to do it and to the farmers out there who who will cry we don't get any subsidies you're talking mm. about well, i'm talking about the subsidies that free we, water f free water um, being allowed to pollute the rivers, you'd never get away with this in Europe that you're yeah. getting away with here. You know, so sure they might be subsidised, but that but they're not uh, allowed to do what what we allow yeah. to happen. So yeah, it's a direct versus an indirect subsidy, I guess, is the question. So, real tale of two regions there. Mm -hmm. You know, minor changes probably going to get us there and yep. through most of the country. Yeah, Canterbury, big changes ahead land use changes you know potential stop gaps if people want to keep animal yep. farming but as you say synthetic proteins coming down mm -hmm. the pipeline um, there's some some pretty massive issues there um, so what what do we need to do do you think to uh, to help I mean because you know I mean you know plenty of farmers yourself and and none of us want to see them going out of business and no. and uh and and bankrupt and all that sort of stuff what do you think we need to do to help particularly canterbury transition uh you know move through to this brave yeah world? well i mean we, we we've had you know 20 30 years of mismanagement and and farmers have been caught up in that you know and and i and i really feel for the farmers that are down there especially the ones that are not corporates that are family farms or individuals that have borrowed up to the eyeballs to buy those farms and I, I, I think you know we, we're going to have to help the change I don't think they're going to be able to do it by themselves there's going to have to be some help go into it but I can see what that landscape could and should look like you know um, it's, it's just it's a ground zero at the moment and, and it should be a much nicer place to be and you know, uh, to, to getting away from monocultures and to something much more like permaculture and having, having a whole mixture of land uses, regenerative farming happening on those landscapes, which would be much better from a community social point of view as well. You know, you've got so many bad things that are happening with, you know, sort of gutting of those little towns and things. Something like, I can't get the exact figures, but something like 70% of the farm workers are from overseas. So, yeah. you know, it's, a, it's not like it's, it's doing great things for the community. You get towns booming with, you know, um, irrigation company um, offices and tractor yards and things like that. They look, they look, you know, like they're booming, but they're not really. It's, it's, just, it's just part of a growth you know, and then once it once it stops growing, then all those things pack up and go. You know, unless we get some more of those big winds come and bowl all the irrigators like they did a few years ago, and then there'll be some more work. You know, for the irrigation companies. But basically, it's one of those boom and bust kind of cycles that you get. Yeah. You know, and we're at the bust end of it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so I just it's it's there's no easy way out of this. You know, I can't see a happy ending. You know, when you when you let it go so far, there is no happy way out of this, and we just have to face that reality and bite the bullet and and help them out. I think. And maybe a bit of research into different. I mean, as you say, you know, there's there's people trying regenerative mm. agriculture around the country. There's people trying different land uses. Well, I mean, but we, don't, I, we don't really research it. We don't research it and we don't support them. I mean, the guys, the, the farmers that I know that want to cut back on, on fertilizer use, the, the next thing, the banks on the phone, you know, the, the banks have so much invested in these farms and they watch them like, you know, and if they stop buying fertilizer, the bank thinks, well, they won't make any money without fertilizer. And, you know, so there's so much pressure and pressure from the industry, not, you know, the amount of effort that's gone into try and cover up that reality that you can make more money with less you know because because they want i mean obviously from fonterra they just want volume the fertilizer companies just want to sell more of their products um and they're same with the irrigation companies they're not going to tell the truth the, the farmers are, are left in this world where there's you know there's there's one group telling them that what they're doing is bad and this other group here telling them that buy more of our stuff do more of it and they're stuck somewhere in the middle and there's some really progressive ones who get it and some that are just trapped in it 
and so much of our research budget goes to projects yeah. that are based on the com on the projects that the irrigate the, the uh, fertilizer companies want yep. to see because they're the ones that'll yeah pay you know help pay for the research. well I mean you look at all the funding that goes into the agricultural universities all comes from industry yeah. nearly all of it you know so they they all the the whole crop of of young you know farming advisors and consultants and things are coming through this industrial model you know they're they're at uni wearing you know um, fleeces with Fonterra and and Ravensdown and Balance on their shirts you know that it's because you were at Massey. Yeah, yeah. That's what was that like being <laughs> outspoken at Massey? About well, you can imagine being at a uh, agricultural university, pointing out the impacts of agriculture didn't go down <laughs> too well, you know. Uh, yeah, but but it should be it should be a positive thing. But they didn't see it like that. I mean, there was a lot of pressure went on. I mean, Steve Mahari was the vice chancellor there, and he he tells me how the Federated Farmers used to ring him every week and demand that I be sacked. You know. <laughs> They, they just thought that the uni should have this corporate view of the world and if, and if it's, you know, if they put lots of money into it then therefore the, the uni should have this one view, you know, and that should be that farming's, industrial farming's the way to go kind of thing. So, yeah, it, it, was, it was hard being in there, you know. Sounds like you had your freedom of speech threatened. You should tell ACT about that, <laughs> tell David Seymour. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but that, 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 would, mm. have been, that would have been tough. Yeah, yeah, I mean, although I have to say that I get a huge amount of support, you know, for, for, for every, um, you know, uh, got, you know every, every attack that I got, I got 20, you know, letters of support and, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's, not, it's not as harsh as it might seem from the outside, you know. Great. Yeah. Right, well, uh, I just want to throw it open to the, to the crowd, Mike, and see if there's any... any um Questions out there? I've got a question for you about social license. So um, it struck me that National kind of lost its social license the day Nick Smith stood by a river and told us dumb things about those numbers for water quality. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then his officials couldn't explain the stats because they there was no explaining it. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the swimmable rivers. Yeah, that's the swimmable yeah. rivers. Let's move yeah. the goalposts conversation. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so my feeling is that lots of New Zealanders got really grumpy at that point. Mm. Um, and I, my guess is, I mean, certainly I rethought the way I was going to vote, not that I was ever going to vote national, but I mm. really thought hard about how I was going to vote in that election because I was personally really angry about that. I, I felt some skullduggery had gone on. Mm. And I think a lot of other Kiwis thought the same thing. We really mm. care about water quality, even though we haven't quite mastered the detail of what, what it takes to keep kōkapu alive. Mm. Nonetheless, we know that something bad's happening. So do you think there's... Um, some kind of support or could be some kind of support from ordinary Kiwis for doing something very different in say Canterbury? Well I think you've got that, the, a couple of things that came to mind when you were saying that. The mandate that this government feels that it has to change the regulations is because 80% of New Zealanders, you know, in, in a couple of polls now have said that's the most important issue. Also if you, um, you want to read about it, there's a great article in so the Institute of Governance and Policy Studies does um, a quarterly um, policy quarterly that comes out quarterly, surprisingly. And um, <laughs> it, in the latest one uh, on water, which you can get for free online, there's a, um, an article and, um, by Don Rood. And he, he, uh, he basically explains, and, and he quotes David Farrar and a few others, that, that the, the feeling in the street was, you know, from these experts, that National lost that that election over fresh water, you know, and I mean, I think that's that's how that's how important it is to to, to New Zealanders, yeah. Which hopefully bodes well for a, a, a bit of backbone in terms of how this current process pans yeah. out. Oh, like, yeah, I look. I'm just cynical as hell because I've been burnt so many times, but it, they have made they being you know some forces within Ministry for the Environment have been trying very, very hard to not have that happen. And, and I don't know how deep it goes and how successful they'll be, but, but I imagine that with this coalition, it, it's gonna be really hard for them to be hard on, on fresh water. You know, that's, that's you kind of the reality. You don't want to say first, but that's what you Yeah, well, that's what I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 
to me, they're, they're, they're the worst, you know, as far as environment, you know, they're the worst thing that ever happened to, to New Zealand government, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for that. Um, I was wondering if you could shed some light on the other side of the story, and you'll know more than this than I do, but um, Topor. Yep. And they've had a nitrogen market there for years, haven't mm, they? And I mm. believe it's quite successful and came in yep. ahead of schedule and below budget. And so just as an example well, of... Well, yeah, but that's, that's an example of, a, of, of paying farmers not to farm. So you, you, there was $90 million of taxpayers' money went into a handful of farms to stop them farming. In Lake Rotorua at the moment, you've got the same thing happen. $40 million is um, being paid to have farmers not farm. So there are great examples to me of there's two iconic lakes that we care enough about that we're going to pay farmers not to farm. You know, so everyone's saying, oh, you know, um, um, Todd Muller on, on radio this morning that farming's not the problem, you know, it's, it's urbanites. But yet here you have these two examples of lakes where we are paying $400 for every kilogram of nitrogen leached. Or we have paid in Lake Taupo example. So in Lake Rotorua, they've got to reduce 100 tonnes of the nitrogen going into there, so they're paying $40 million, which is $400 a kilogram. I calculated it out for, if you wanted to do the same for Canterbury, um, somewhere around $12 billion you'd have to pay Canterbury farmers to not pollute those rivers if you were going to pay them the same rate that we played in Taupo and, and Rotorua. So, it's, not, it's not the solution. Well, yeah, I mean, but well, if you've got $12 billion, that's still a solution. You pay them not to do it and they just do something else. I mean, that's the thing. It's always, it's always framed as if, if they weren't milking cows, well, then that land would be producing nothing, you know? So it's like the end of the world if we stop dairy. No, because we would do something else, you know? It's, we, we just, it's, it's there. It's, it's got a huge history, it gets hugely supported and um, mm -hmm. yeah, if we could just have a grown up conversation yeah. about it one day and go, hang on a minute, this, is, this isn't good for New Zealand, you know, um, we need to rethink what we're doing. And that's ultimately what the modelling that, uh, that, that was done for Dairy NZ about these reforms, uh, you know, in, ended up saying, you know, land will get used for something else. Uh, people will get employed other places, mm. and actually, the, in the end, the impact isn't isn't There's that nothing. great. Yeah. DNZ tried to dress up the figures as being really big, but it but mm. it was it was actually quite small small numbers. Yeah. In, in the end, but yeah, I mean, on that Topo and and Rotorua example, I mean, there's two there's two things there. What you know, one is the that they they did use a market mechanism to to you know to to get the result, which was which was pretty successful. The other side is the political side, which is that these are the only places that we've managed to get farmers to agree to make these changes, and the only way to get them to agree to make the changes was by compensating them. So that's it's it's more the political side where mm. that where the where, where the money came in to try and make it stick. Yeah. And that was a local decision, sorry. It was the. No, no, no. Those that. those were national. Yep. Uh, those were national governments <coughs> funding <coughs> funding a local solution. Yeah, yeah. Because they were seen as iconic. Yeah. You know, Topo and Rotorua were seen as iconic. Yeah. Hi. Thanks Hi. for that. Um, I'm wondering about the carrot rather than the stick um, here, because there's a lot of stick being talked about, and that I hear, and the um, I'm just wondering what this something else is, and mm. who's working on it. Well, yeah, that, I mean, it's an interesting one. And, and the trouble is, there's a couple of things that come to mind. Is that one that you, you shut the gate on future options by what we're doing now. So a really good example was, I, I work on this environmental reference group with Landcorp. And um, they've got big issues down in Southland because they've got farms down there. And, you know, all the winter cropping stuff that made the news that seeing cows up to their necks in mud, they saw that coming a few years ago. And um, with the help of us being on this group, and so they looked at, traditionally, go back only 20 years, and that was a really big oak growing area down there where these farms are in, in Southland. So they said, well, let's, let's make oat milk instead. Let's do the sums on oat milk. And, and it came out really good. There's more, way more protein per hectare. You know, you just imagine a cow 
is a machine running and it's got to stay warm, it's got to do all these other things. So a whole lot of its energy gets dissipated as heat and all that kind of thing. The most efficient way to produce protein is not to have the animal there. So they showed that you could make way less greenhouse gas emissions, way less water use, all that kind of thing, make the oat milk. The th trouble is you've got to find the markets for it. You've got to, you know, it's a big, someone's got to, got to build the factory, someone's got to find the market. You know, the, the producer's not going to do that. But there was a partner down there with Venture Southland who thought it was a good idea. And so they started, started working on, you know, how, how, how it could come about. Then at some stage, somebody decided to look at the, uh, at the water uh, around that area because you need good clean water to make oat milk, you know, to make plant-based milk. Turns out that some of those bores around there are 60 milligrams. So they're six times or five times the World Health Organization limit wow. already just in 20 years because of that. So that's what I mean by shutting the gate on the future. So bad shit that we're doing now has had shut that option down because there wasn't the water available near the site to be able to use to make that option. So, so I was trying to, two, two answers to your question is that some, it needs some kind of higher level support. It's not going to be like the farmers deciding to produce oats. Somebody has to, you know, it has to, it has to so the carrot has to come from outside of farming. So, so a, a sort of a, a much, much more um, strategic, strategic, that's the yeah. word, approach to, to how we change. Because you know? at the moment, farmers can just make the milk, and a tanker turns up, yep. takes it away, and they don't have to worry about anything, yeah, processing. Yeah markets mm, mm, anything fonterra mm, takes care of it all mm, which which is what makes dairy such an attractive proposition yeah. to a farmer right you just have mm. to make the milk but okay so and it's interesting you mentioned landcorp there because because landcorp have been looking at alternative land uses as you say in southland and canterbury and waikato i mean <coughs> Could they could they be doing more if if the government wasn't driving them so hard to to make a profit because they they're, they're an SOE they have to make a profit right yeah. yeah yeah and their SOE minister is Shane Jones who's given them quite a clear I mean I was at a public meeting where he said um, you show me the money honey is is his is what he said to Landcorp. You know, so Langle best to make the money. Make the money. So you know, I mean, this they is our, should. This is our biggest farmer. Yeah, and they should be leading the way, and they could be leading the way. Now, the previous government, as far as I could understand, it was certainly how we sold it because it, you know, we were we started this um, environmental reference group under the previous government, and and for them, it was sold as. You don't have to legislate. This is a way of avoiding legislation. Is to have your farmer show. A different way of doing it yeah. leading your, your your government farms lead the way so that people will follow because it you know it's a very much a, a, you know farming is very much farmers looking over the fence to see what the neighbors doing you know yeah. and, and and it works really really well so there's an opportunity that that's been lost you know where it could and, and they have the scale to yeah to make the oat milk factories yep. or, to, or the or yeah the, to or really the, look at that marketing side the yeah. fruit yeah. packing factories or yeah. the well at least tee up those you know yeah. get involved in those you know um, combining with with other companies to get that happening you know guaranteeing providing the product so that so that then someone will put their neck on the line to make the, the processing plant yeah. and all that kind of thing yeah yeah so that it's an interesting concept about getting more strategy mm. in there Yes. Thanks, Mike. Um, I hear a lot of people um, saying, look, you keep, uh, you people keep picking on farmers, but really, um, you know, look at urban mm. problems with water. Is that a straw man or is there something we should be really worried about with urban waterways? Oh, no, definitely. It's not a straw man that <laughs> is real. The only straw man part of it is that less than 1% of the length of our rivers in New Zealand are in urban catchments. and. 30 to 40 percent are in pasture catchments so you know if it's a triage thing you go for the big problem first right but we we have massive issues coming up with um, infrastructure and so 
the latest study that um, Water New Zealand did showed that so 100, there's about 300 wastewater treatment plants in New Zealand, 154 of them discharged to water, to rivers and, and lakes, and of them only 147 meet the level B standard for their outfall. So only five, seven of them actually comply, or would actually get better than a B. And, and it's, it's, it's stuffed infrastructure. The actual plants themselves are okay, and they work fine. It's the fact that all the infrastructure is broken so that when it rains, you know, this, you hear it happening in Auckland, it happens here all the time. Fielding was, was the classic for me, where, where when it rains in fielding, the uh, flow to the wastewater treatment pl plant goes up 60 times, times 60 flow. They've got no storage, it just goes into the plant and out into the river because there's no way you can treat that because it's all of that rainfall inflow that goes into it. Same with Auckland, they have to bypass, that's why the beaches get all shut and all that kind of thing. So the plants themselves could do with an upgrade, but it's the infrastructure. You know, some of it's 100 years old, massive. They did an estimate of the costs of getting those 100 and failing 140 or whatever plants. They were looking at least $2 billion to, to get to get them just to meet that B standard. So it's another, you know, it's a massive, massive amount of money that, you know, councils have just, you know, failed to look after that side of things. Still, uh, two, two billion is not the end of the world. No, no, well, of, I suppose, uh, yeah, we, yeah. Compared to what we compared spent. to twelve billion or yep. whatever you yeah yeah for Christchurch yeah. Canterbury Canterbury yeah 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 any other oh yeah um, I've got a technology question so I've been involved on a bunch of unsuccessful research proposals that are to do with water quality one way or another there was uh, one that was novel membranes mm -hmm. uh, to clean up um, flow from uh, dairying for instance, uh, that failed. Um, there was another one um, looking at um, uh, sampling waterways using drones and boats, so radio-controlled boats mm -hmm. and drones in combination, and um, so having the instruments on the little boats and so on, that failed. That was quite a fun one. Um, <laughs> and like then um, a bit more recently, there was a space-related one. So um, Xterra said that one way you could use satellites over New Zealand was actually to look at pollution and waterways mm. because you can pick stuff up in between times because yep. you're looking at it, you're passing over it yep. a couple of times a day so you can see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And that one failed also. Mm. Um, any advice on um, how we can actually deploy technology in use, I mean, I haven't given up, of course, no, no. but um, in useful ways that would actually materially impact on water quality? Well, I mean, the technology of, of, of continuous monitoring is one of the things that we've put the STAG put forward. So, and that's what the PCE is talking about as well, is that we measure those things properly. I think, you know, at the heart of it, even, you know, and it's, it's kind of sad and depressing, but we, we, even if the stuff gets through, by the time it makes its way through to plans, now I suspect dairy will be finished by the time, you know, if, even if we get it through, because it's such a, I mean, we had, we had quite clearly under the RMA, you know, there's quite, you could go through section two and find all of the, all of the legislation you need to not have happened what happened. So we, we don't, I don't think we, yeah, so we, I'm kind of ambivalent about technology because it seems to cause a whole lot of other problems, but, but just to sort of step back is that we, ha it's not, it's not a lack of the of the science or the legislation. It's the lack of will or or enforcement or f or resources that go into actually doing it. You know, we we if we just applied what we had, if we just used what we had properly, then then we could fix it. But there's this real. I mean, I've been involved in four court cases, taking Horizons Regional Council to court to get them to apply their own rules to protect fresh water, let alone, you know, national policy statement rules. It's just to get them to apply their own rules because they don't want to limit farming, you know, and because of the influence of the industry. So because basically they they brought in a fantastic plan and then their council got voted out and a yep. bunch of farmers got voted in. Yeah, it was a, it was a coup yeah. that was funded by federated farmers and right. and changed it. And and so yeah, then it's just been a battle ever since. So yeah, I don't, you know, so in that way, 
we could have all the technology and all of that. If we don't have the will and the guts to actually do something and enforce it, then we don't, we don't get anywhere, you know? It would be, I mean, it's like having, you know, speed limits and never having any cops or any cameras, you know, which like it was in the 70s, you know, and everyone drove drunk and sped everywhere and all that kind of thing, you know? That's what happens. If you don't enforce and have a stick there, then nothing changes, you know, as far as I can see. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, but, but it's just like, I, I have to be, in, you know, I feel like it's important to be involved in this whole process, but I also realise that nothing's going to change unless we, we change that uh, uh, enforcement as well. And that has been the criticism from the environmental NGOs about, about the plan. Mm. Fantastic science, fantastic limits. How is this actually going to be implemented? Mm. How are you actually going to make this stick has been from what I've seen, the kind of the resounding question from the environmental side. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Any words of wisdom or thoughts on, on that sort of stuff? Oh, I think that we have to take um, the measuring and the monitoring and the reporting away from regional councils. We should have the EPA or some central body so that every, at the moment, everyone's doing their own thing. It's a real mess. And, and, and you've got the vested interests who are reporting on themselves so they don't they want the data to be crap because they don't want themselves to look bad if we had an independent body and that's pretty much you know along the lines of what the pce is saying as well we've got an epa make it truly independent give it some money you know and 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 have it have it done properly you know and and then and then you would have some truth and then we might be able to start changing things not when they're playing games with the data like they do at the moment one last question, anyone? Oh yes, this, is a camera it, this might take a <coughs> few minutes though. Jeff, could you give us a rundown on TOPS policy in regard to water, very briefly, and see how that how that could possibly line up with some of the visions that, mm. uh, and, and science that Mike has going on there? Very briefly, I mean, I think what Mike's uh, you know set out with the. Um, with the, the limit side of things is, is exactly what we were proposing at the last election. I mean, we're kind of waiting to see how this current process pans out to, to um, you know, refresh our policy there. But I think what, what the government has set out is, is, um, is, is pretty solid. Uh, we had some, some ideas on implementation at the, you know, at, at the last election, which um, the main one being that we don't favour something called grandparenting, which is giving the ability to continue to pollute to those that polluted the, par the most in the past. And that's one of the big problems with a lot of the processes that have gone on to try to solve this problem, is that you've hit up against, well, I've invested all this money in my farm on the basis that I can pollute, so I should be allowed to continue to, to, to pollute. Could you call it historic cronyism? Oh, historic cronyism mm -hmm. is a is a is a great is a great way of of translating the word grandparenting into English. Yes, that's that's totally true. So that that's our that's our big concern with the implementation side of this that you need to a avoid that sort of stuff, and make sure that the people who have done a lot to reduce their their pollution, as as Mike said, you know, there's a lot of people out there doing some really good stuff, and they should be rewarded for that mm. um, uh, you know rather than rather than effectively punished which is which is how it's happened in a, in a lot of places um, the other side of this of course which we haven't talked about is 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 pricing water and and that's a, a big part of our policy too uh, honoring te tiriti maori rights over fresh water uh, you know putting a, a price on fresh water so that commercial water users pay for the for the water that they use and that gives us money which we can then recycle into well partly you know resolving those Māori fresh water rights but also investing in cleaning up all the stuff and that's when Mike talks about um, we're going to have to help Canterbury I agree with you and that's going to take some money where's that money going to come from I don't think that should be coming from taxpayers um, personally, um, so that you know that that's a, a big part of that conversation as well um, going forward, which we haven't really talked on, which is 
water quantity and water and water pricing and of course water bottlers are a big part of that in terms of making them pay as well um, so those are the those are kind of the, the big things within um, top policy the work that Mike was part of the work that the, the government is currently consulting on looks great the big question is how do we make it stick uh, I agree with what Mike said and, the, and there's a lot of work that needs to go on to actually help implement that. It's, uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, uh, what's really slowing this process down to some degree is lobbying from more powerful groups within the mm -hmm. historic industry and that's corrupting the actual uh, movement on this whole policy and, and clean water issue, correct? Well I just, I, I, I'm shocked at, at, the, at just how much lobbying power those industries have within our government departments and that, that's, you know, I had, since moving to Wellington and being involved in policy studies is that that's really, really amazed me that I kind of imagined that these ministries were there, you know, as looking after the public, but, you know, just been so appalled at what I've seen about that industry pressure that, that's, that's the lobbying power that's in there. And I would say from, from my observation of what happened under the last government, the last government took an approach from, I think it was somewhere in Scandinavia, Sweden mm. or something, the sort of collaborative yeah. approach. Nationally that was called the Land and Water Forum, different regions had their own collaborative forums. Fantastic idea, fantastic theory, um, which then got bogged down in the same thing. Mm. And, and ultimately, when you've got local communities who aren't funded, who are you know, scra scraping every spare moment of their time to participate in these processes, and they're up against professional yeah. lobbyists. It's not. It's that's not a fair fight. It's not, a, and it's and it can't be collaborative because there's a power imbalance there, and so that really. That really killed, from what I saw, the 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 previous, you know, the mm. the the stuff that the previous government had was was. You know, had set up um, that may that may have been their intention. Who knows? Um, it's, it's difficult to yeah. difficult to tell. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That was that was, and it's still happening now. You know, the zone committees, the fight tour committees, the you know, everyone's got another name for them. But it's basically that idea that you go to the community, which sounds fantastic, except that that it's the uneven power, and you know, for example, I remember one of them. You know. Upper Manawatu, uh, you you have a, a catchment group up there that says, "Oh, we're okay with carrying on doing what we're doing," because they can just go up the road into the Ruahinis to a nice river to swim. But the the community down at Foxton, at the bottom of the Manawatu River, they didn't get a say with what this group up there said. I mean, so if they're catchment-based ones, then maybe they work. But you can see how there's those, but the the people lower down the river have to take what happens yeah. upstream. The upstream ones want to carry on doing what they're doing because supposedly it's worth good money because they can go a bit further upstream to get above where the impacts are. So there's so many reasons why it, it doesn't work. Interesting point. And, and just, to, just to finish on, I mean, one of the first things we met doing was, was, was doing a piece of work with a whole bunch of scientists because there is such division over this issue uh, doing work with a whole bunch of scientists to, to try and see it, how much common ground there was on freshwater science, you know, because you hear one thing from the industry and one thing mm. from the freshwater ecologists. But actually, when the scientists all got together, there was an incredible amount of agreement. Yeah, totally. I mean, I've been portrayed as being out there, you know, crazy Mike Joy on this, you know, one milligram yeah. nitrate stuff. You, you put together the STAG group and the 16 scientists agree on that. It yeah. wasn't a problem. It never, I've never gone into a situation with a bunch of scientists where we have a problem. Yeah. It's, it's just a whole bunch of industry paid people yeah. pushing a line. You know, it's not, yeah. this, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a science issue, it's a politics issue. Yeah. And pretty much the only disagreement I observed between you and the, and the dairy NZ scientists in that initial uh, uh, conversation mm. was, 
they didn't like the idea that it was all dairy's fault. Right. And 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 partly they're right because as you said at the start, sedimentation mm. started with yeah. European colonization. Mm. Yeah. When we cut all the trees down on yeah. the hills and yeah. all the mud ended up yep. in the rivers. Yeah. So yeah, they're right. Mm. But in the past 20, 30 years, it's mm. dairy. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Dr. Mike Joy. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for your time, Mike. No and worries. I think in December we have your boss. Yes. Simon Chapel. Yep, he'll be interesting. Yeah. He's coming to talk about, um, uh, like, well, effectively, how can we get our civil servants to give fearless, free and frank advice? Uh, which is a, a massive issue mm. uh, facing, uh, as, as I guess we have touched on with this example tonight. Yeah. Yep. Thanks for your time, Mike. Okay, no worries. Cheers. Cheers.